And so to Saul, these people aren't individuals. They're just kind of like pawns on a chessboard that he's moving around and trying to get rid of his enemies by using them as tools for his own benefit. David loved Jonathan, and he loved his wife Machal, who was, da was Saul's daughter. He looked at people as individuals and didn't, you know, think of them as merely what they could do for him or how they could work against him. He just saw them. Hey there, fellow tacticians. Don't forget to like and subscribe and ring that little notification bell because the more likes and subscriptions I get, the more people see my conservative content, which will make America a better place and angers the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for The Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Our Chaplain's Report is going to be continuing in the book of 1 Samuel. And the only thing that you really need to know about this is that David and Jonathan, they're about to test Saul. So you may recall in the last Chaplain's Report that what's going on here is David saying, uh, Jonathan, your dad's tried to kill me a few times, and I'm pretty sure he's only inviting me to this new moon Sabbath feast because he's going to take it as an opportunity to kill me there. And Jonathan's kind of like, look, I've talked to my dad, and I've already talked him down once, and I really don't think he's going to do that. I think you're worried for nothing. But just to be safe, why don't we orchestrate this little plan to really test and see whether he wants to kill you or do you some kind of harm or not. And so they're having this conversation, and these few verses that we're going to look at today are a part of that conversation as well. So we're going to start in 1 Samuel 20, verses 14 through 17. And if I'm still alive, this is Jonathan speaking, by the way, and if I'm still alive, will you not show me the faithfulness of the Lord so that I will not die? And you shall never cut off your loyalty to my house, not even when the Lord cuts off every one of the enemies of David, from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, May the Lord demand it from the hands of David's enemies. And Jonathan made David a vow again because of his love for him, because he loved him as he loved his own life. There's a few things I want you to notice about this. Even though Jonathan is skeptical of David's claim that Saul wants to kill him, even though his default position when David tells him that is, I don't know, David, it seems to me like you're worried for nothing and I've talked to him before. I don't think that he's actually going to do that. He kind of does the trust but verify thing. He thinks he's right, but he says, you know what, let's test it out. I think that that shows a lot of character from Jonathan because, yeah, Jonathan is skeptical, but he is not against changing his mind if the data bears it out. You see, the truth fears no questions. Jonathan is more concerned with finding out what the truth is behind his father's intentions than he is about being right. I'm sure he'd like to be right. We all like to be right. And Jonathan would rather his father not try to murder his best friend. I think that's a fair assessment. He would like for this thing not to be true. However, he is still willing to move forward with a test of his father's intentions because he wants to get to the truth. And he will abide by the truth regardless of where it leads him. He has an idea, he has an opinion, and he feels very strongly about it, but he still thinks that truth is more important than his opinion. That's what a Christian is supposed to do from the very beginning. That's what we all need to do, is we need to believe in objective truth and that we will follow it no matter where it may lead us. But Jonathan also in this, believes that, his, or that God's will is more important than his will. You see, he knows that God favors David and that he has already promised that David will be king. He knows this. He knows that it means that, that Saul's line is going to be cut off and it's going to be transferred to David. And remember, Jonathan is in Saul's line. He is the prince. And because of this, he could presumably be king, and if he were to be, you know, 
if, if Saul were to lose his crown and it gets shifted over to David, then Jonathan's no longer in a, a royal line of succession. Jonathan has no chance of getting the crown. That doesn't matter to him. He wants God's will, not what he wants. That's the difference. And as Christians, that's what we're called to do too. That, yeah, there are things that we want, there are things that we want God to do for us, but ultimately when it comes down to it, part of being a disciple of Christ, part of being somebody that is a, a person that lives by God's standard means that occasionally what you're going to have to do is submit your will to his to accept that God's will is better than your will, and because of that, you are willing to subjugate yourself to him. That's what Jonathan is doing here. He's saying, even though I don't want this to be true, if it is true, I will follow it, because it's God's will. And he also puts God's will above his father's will as well, and that is admirable as well. You have to keep in mind, with what Jonathan's asking here, you have to keep in mind the culture of the day. Because back then, when a family took over the throne, they killed every single member of the other family because they did not want rivals. They did not want anybody with a legitimate claim to the crown to rise up and build a resistance and try to overthrow them again. And so when one family goes in and takes over and becomes the new royal family, they kill every single member so that there is not even a chance that old line could come back. And all Jonathan does here is he asks David, when you take the throne, and I believe that you will because it's God's will, just deal kindly with me and my family. When God cuts that off, I just want you to remember that I'm not your enemy. And I don't want to do any harm by you. And, you know, he loves him. He, he's his best friend. He doesn't want to see anything terrible happen to David. And he says, so... When that happens, just deal kindly with my family. It's okay. It's God's will. I understand it. But remember that I wasn't the one that did that to you. That I'm not your enemy. And so, Jonathan trusts David to do the right thing. He has so much faith in his friend that he can make this request of him because he knows that David is going to do the right thing regardless of what happens. Whether David is a a rebel on the run like he is now that doesn't really have any power, or he becomes king of the nation, which of course he eventually does, he knows that that power is not going to change David, that David is going to do the right thing, that he is going to follow God's will no matter what his station in life is. That's how much he believes in his friend. And it really is a beautiful thing and a testament to the faith that Jonathan has not only in God but in David as well. And I also want us to look at it from David's perspective because David loves Jonathan enough to not see him as an enemy just because of who his family was. You see, like I said, in this day and age, if somebody that was a member of your family was your enemy, you saw all of them as your enemy. Saul is trying to kill David and wipe him out. And David's response to this is, well, that makes Saul my enemy, but not everybody else. Jonathan's not a bad guy because his father happens to be a bad guy. And that comes from a biblical teaching. That was a new teaching, something that was unique to the Hebrews, that the sins do not bear the, the sin of the father. Uh, sorry, the, the, the father does not bear the sins of the son, nor the, the son the sins of his father. That's in the Torah. That's the law of Moses. And so because of that, David is just following the law of God to its logical conclusion, which is, well, I'm not going to blame Jonathan for the bad things that his dad's done, even if his dad really does want to kill me, and we find out through this test that he's going to try to kill me again. That's not Jonathan's fault. And I can still love Jonathan, even though Saul is my enemy. You see, David, kind of like what we were talking about at the beginning of this episode with the Bill of Rights, David sees people as individuals. And he doesn't treat them differently because of choices that other people made. I think that's a good life lesson for us as Christians and just in general. Is that just because there might be a person in somebody's family or their friend group or something that happens that, that, that they do wrong by us, that doesn't mean that person is responsible for their actions. They may not even know about those actions. Right here, Jonathan doesn't seem to know 
about what Saul's malicious intent is. And he doesn't want to believe that, but ultimately, Jonathan's not responsible for those things. Jonathan makes his own decisions. He's his own moral agent because he, just like everybody else, is an individual that makes his own choices. And God is going to judge us only for our own choices, not for the choices of other people. David did see people like individuals. Saul saw people like pawns in a game. That's how Saul views people. That's why he can use his oldest daughter as a pawn to try to lure David in so he can kill him. And then after that happens, he says, well, I'll give you my other daughter, even though I married off my daughter that I originally promised to you. I'll give you my younger daughter, but you have to go out and kill all of these people. And that was just a ploy to get David killed through the hands of the Philistines. And then he also later uses Jonathan basically as bait to lure David back into him. And so to Saul, these people aren't individuals. They're just kind of like pawns on a chessboard that he's moving around and trying to get rid of his enemies by using them as tools for his own benefit. David loved Jonathan, and he loved his wife Machal, who was, da- was Saul's daughter. He looked at people as individuals and didn't you know, think of them as merely what they could do for him or how they could work against him. He just saw them. And that was the difference in David and Saul. But David and Jonathan really, they were only able to love one another like this because they loved God. David takes the stance that he does on Jonathan and treating him like an individual because he believes the words that God gave him. He believes the Torah. He believes that God is morally right and he follows those principles to lead him to the truth. Jonathan goes against his own father, his own family, and vows a vow to David because he believes that's what God would want him to do. He looks at God's will and says, well, God's will just supersedes my father's will. It's more important than my father's will and more important than my will. And so because of that, I'm going to love the person that is morally right and right in God's sight, and that's David. The reason that they were able to have this close relationship and they were able to treat one another like brothers is because they were under God in his sight. They were able to be unified because they loved him first. You see, if God is love and the source of all love, then ultimately any love that we can have for one another has to originate from him. And that's exactly what we're seeing played out here in this story. Stay the course, friends. It's not exactly a secret that YouTube really doesn't like conservatives, so I'm asking for your help. I don't want to stick it to them. I just genuinely want to show them that conservative voices do matter and that there is a big, passionate audience out there that wants to hear them. So give us a like and subscribe, remembering to click the notification bell, and show YouTube that you do want more content like this. Sincerely, thank you.